And welcome to this Intelligence Squared podcast with me, Gideon Rachman. I'm Chief uh, Foreign Affairs Commentator for the Financial Times, and I'm delighted to introduce our guest today, Rana Mitta. He's the director of the University of Oxford China Centre and author of the new book, China's Good War, How World War II is Shaping a New Nationalism. And here, indeed, is the book. Um, and if you enjoy today's podcast, don't forget to pr press the like button and subscribe to the channel. And indeed, if I can suggest you might also like my own podcast, we're all doing it these days. Uh, it's called The Rachman Review. It's on international affairs and it comes out every week on the FT. Uh, if you have strong views on the discussion I'm about to have with Rana, let us know, let us know what you think in the comment sections below. Uh, so Rana, let's get going. Um, you call the book China's Good War, and one of the points that you make is that, sorry, um, let me just call up the screen again. Uh, so, so Rana, you call the book China's Good War. One of the points you make is that in 2015, they had a huge commemoration of the war in Beijing, uh, but this was the first time this had happened uh, since the end of the war. So why is China now thinking more about the Second World War with the passage of time? Thanks, Gideon. I mean, great to be here chatting with you, and thank you for introducing the topic of the book China's Good War, which is essentially this question of why China today, even in a way that's slightly unnoticed, I think, by the outside world, has really got very, very fixated on the idea of the Second World War as a way of understanding its current condition. And as you said, pretty much just exactly five years ago, in September of 2015, uh, China held an enormous parade in the center of Beijing in Tiananmen Square, obviously both literally and symbolically a very, very central place. Different sorts of memories, of course, for Westerners who think of that as a place where the horrific killings of 1989 took place. But in the wider sense, of course, also a very ceremonially important place for the Chinese government. And so in some ways it was puzzling that they had this hugely powerful ceremony with you know thousands of parading soldiers and weaponry of the most um, uh, uh, impressive uh, sort one way or, or another and plenty of global leaders there to commemorate the 70th anniversary as it then was of the end of, of, of World War II and the central reason I would say is this like many other societies around the world, including Britain, which actually is a country that still, as, as you know very well, likes to use metaphors about World War II to explain its current condition, China has also done something very similar. The difference from Britain, the difference from the United States as well, though, is that for really about 30 years or so, under the era of Chairman Mao, China didn't talk that much about World War II, a little bit, but mostly about the communist role in a very limited way. And then really over the last 25, 30 years, it started to talk about China in a really major way. And this parade, this huge parade, which is on national television in China, watched by you know, hundreds of millions of people, was the symbolic center of this new elevation of World War II and China's victory in World War II as this central defining moment in China's identity. So I'd say that in a weird way, that huge parade in Tiananmen Square was an example of identity politics at its most... Um, uh, and it's most strong in, in, in some ways in, in contemporary China. So why have they lighted upon the Second World War as so central to this new version of identity politics, having not done so, as you say, for 30 years during the Mao period? What, what's, what's the point? There are a couple of reasons, I think, Gideon, why today's China has World War II running through its veins, you might say. And when I say that, I would say that everywhere from these, you know, that huge parade I've mentioned, but also educational textbooks, video games played by teenagers and not teenagers too, television programs, even movies. Uh, most recently, I mean, this, this last month, um, August, the biggest box office hit in China as they reopened their cinemas after COVID was a World War II extravaganza called The 800, which I've actually seen. It's, it's quite a, an impressive piece of, uh, piece of work. So there are two main reasons, I think. The first one is actually the sheer fact, and this is often something, again, that isn't, I think, always well understood in the West, of what happened in China during World War II. It's perhaps one of, if not the single most de uh, devastating event that took place in China across a frankly very turbulent 20th century. More than 10 million dead after the invasion by Japan, 14 million by, by some counts, very, very high uh, casualty rate. 80 to 100 million Chinese becoming refugees in their own country. And of course, immensely lengthy conflict. For China, it began not in 1939, 
1937 and lasted all the way up to 1945. And not incidentally, of course, they were holding down over half a million Japanese troops well before Pearl Harbor for about four and a half years. So in terms of historical significance, I think one element of its importance is people today remembering events which make them feel in some ways very patriotically proud, but which they feel are underappreciated by the outside world. But the other reason I think has much more to do with what you might call the psychology of contemporary China. I mean, many people, particularly, you know, I think people who listen into the Intelligence Squared podcast will be very well traveled at times when we can actually, you know, travel around anywhere and have been to China and have seen, you know, the skyscrapers, the increasingly high standards of living, the smartphones everywhere, Alibaba, all this sort of thing. But in China, as in many other countries, there's an increasing sense also that consumerism isn't enough, that somehow that higher standard of living, the economics, is not the only thing bringing people together. And in an age when you know, the, the radical uh, re re revolution of the cultural revolution of the 1960s, half a century ago, seems to be very inward looking, uh, really a very unproductive uh, way of, of, of thinking about what a modern China should be, there's a strong element that wants to hark back to that period, a little bit like Britain in some ways, when everyone seemed to be standing together co in a common conflict against the, the enemy. So there's a sort of nostalgic, patriotic element as well that says something about the contrast with the consumerism of today's China. And is there also a political agenda? Because um, it sometimes seemed to me that this vogue for the Second World War becomes being pushed quite hard by the government itself, by the Communist Party in the aftermath of, of Tiananmen Square. Uh, and it creates a kind of a different narrative um, and a different sense of loyalty for the Communist Party, particularly given the stress on uh, their role in, in defeating the Japanese. Well, there absolutely is a political agenda. And there's no doubt that if you go to somewhere like the uh, Museum of the War of Resistance Against Japanese Aggression, to use the title for the war most commonly used in Beijing itself, which actually is a fascinating museum and any visitor to Beijing can go there. It's about you know 30 kilometers from the center of, uh, of town and it's, it's, it's located right at the Marco Polo Bridge the, uh, for the Chinese iconic site where the war actually broke out in July of 1937. So you'll see there a version of history that in some ways does push forward this idea that the leading role of the Chinese Communist Party was first of all to lead the fight in defeating the Japanese and then of course as we know later fight a civil war against the, the nationalists or the Kuomintang under Chiang Kai-shek and, and conquer China. But one of the things that makes the politics of it I think so interesting is that that's not the whole story and it hasn't been really for at least 30 years and maybe even a little longer, certainly since the 1980s. Because to make the story of World War II really work for the China of today, the China that wants to go global and not just be seen as a sort of revolutionary radical power in, it, in a rather inward looking way, is that it had to let the other actors back into the story. So yes, the Chinese Communist Party is still by Beijing you know, pushed forward as, as the leading light, but actually one thing that's happened is that their old opponents in the civil war, the nationalists, uh, the Guomindang under Chiang Kai-shek, who actually did the majority of the battle fighting during those eight years of World War II, their story has now been pushed back much more to the forefront. It's never been officially acknowledged. Nobody's ever got up and said in public, yes, these people were people we used to say did absolutely nothing and they never fought the Japanese and they were useless and now we've changed our mind. But actually, that's exactly what's happened. The old civil war enemy have been rehabilitated as, as actually patriots who did fight against the Japanese. And the other element, and I think in one sense, one of the things that I found most affecting in terms of researching the book, is that it's enabled stories from ordinary people in China, which were repressed for a long time to come forth. So, of course, the Communist Party wants people to talk about the Communist Party role, and the Communists did actually fight guerrilla warfare that was very important. But what people wanted to talk to me about was, you know, the story about their grandmother, who had actually kind of gone from some tiny village on the victory day in August 1945 to the big city of Chongqing, the temporary capital, to see the fireworks and the celebrations. And the reason that Granny had only been able to tell those stories in private for decades and decades is because she lived not in the communist area, but the nationalist area of China during the war. And under Mao, it simply wasn't permitted to tell those stories in public. So it is about politics, but it's also about personal stories and a much more broadened understanding of what's important in recent Chinese history to today's population. Mm. And one of the points you make in the book is that different countries have different Second World Wars, if you like, that there's an Anglo-American Second World War, uh, 
there's a Russian Second World War, there's a Japanese Second World War, and the Chinese, I mean, it's not just that there were different events on their fought on the song, that that's a key part of it, but it's just a different approach to what the war was all about. Um, you, you argue, for example, that um, for the Chinese, it wasn't a war for freedom so much as a war for order. That's absolutely right. And I use the term circuits of memory, which I hope doesn't sound too jargon-like, but it was a way of trying to express this idea that we often talk about, you know, collective memory of war. And I think in recent years, we've moved away from it being purely national. Of course, national stories are very important, as we in Britain have seen this year with, first of all, VE Day and then EJ Day having, be, having to be commemorated uh, under, under lockdown. But in a sense, that sort of wider sense in which World War II is what you make of it for your own system. So, you know, for those of us living in Western Europe, we're living in broadly stable liberal democracies. And our World War II story is about how, you know, the Americans, the British fought back, defeated Hitler, and then created that post-1945 order, which we still value today and which contains, you know, the, the EU, NATO, and, and so forth. That, of course, is not remotely the story that the Chinese tell about the war. I mean, in a sense, you think, how could it be? And of course, for China, even in the aftermath of war, the idea of liberal democracy in, in the sense that uh, emerged in Western Europe was not the story that they were able to, uh, able to tell. Instead, the stories they told had several parts. One was really about national unification. Don't forget that at the beginning of the 20th century, there were people both within and, and outside China who were arguing that China was a geographical expression rather than a country. You know, it was being, in the phrase of the era, sliced up like a melon by the different imperial powers. You know, Britain snatches Hong Kong here, Germany snatches Shandong province there, the Russians take a bit up in, 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 uh, in the Northeast, and so forth. So essentially, by fighting in World War II under Chiang Kai-shek, the Chinese managed for the first time in about a century to defeat the um, repeated um, uh, incursions into their territory that have been happening ever since the Opium Wars of the 1840s, and instead re-emerges a very weak, very battered, but sovereign and united China. The problem was- As you say, the, the circuits of memory are, are very different, and that means that although for us in Britain, we have a set of events that, you know, basically all educated people would, would, would have as references, the Battle of Britain, D-Day, Stalingrad, etc. I think the central events of the war in China, however, are much, much hazier. Um, could I ask you, just give us a potted history, really, what were, if you're Chinese, what are your equivalent of Dunkirk, the Battle of Britain, and so on? Absolutely, Gideon. And uh, I would say that the events of World War II in China have probably expanded and changed even in the minds of the Chinese themselves in terms of the last 20 to 30 years, because prior to that, it was only the Communist Party's contributions that were ever really discussed. And now, although those are still part of that, the wider contributions of both the Chinese nationalists, the leaders of China at the time under Chiang Kai-shek, and also, uh, of course, the foreign powers, the Americans and British in particular, who were involved in the China war are part of that too. So very briefly, but I hope with the useful points there, the war proper really bro breaks out in 1937 as a result of the growing tensions between the growing force of Japanese imperialism as Japan turned away from democracy and towards a much more imperialistic and invasive uh, presence on the Asian mainland in the 1920s and 1930s. And China, which of course was then becoming, relatively speaking, much more concerned to reassert its own sovereignty after having been invaded, not just by the Japanese, but by many other countries, including Britain and France from the late 19th century onwards. And essentially the war broke out when there was a confrontation just outside Beijing between locally garrisoned Japanese troops and Chinese troops. It quickly expanded into a continental war. So Chiang Kai-shek and the Japanese opened up new fronts, first of all near Beijing and then at Shanghai. After that, Chiang Kai-shek's government basically undertook a pre-planned move all the way up into the interior of China, where there was a temporary capital in the city of Chongqing, then known as Chongqing, for really the next eight years or so, a city which was bombarded horrifically by air raids, which suffered from uh, tremendous deprivation of food and supplies and, and so forth. And meanwhile, the Chinese communists, who of course had been sent on a long march by Chiang just a few years before, and they were at daggers drawn, actually entered an uneasy united front. So the nationalists and communists allied together against the Japanese as being the greater threat. And China essentially fought on its own, the Chinese and the nationalists and communists, for four and a half years until Pearl Harbor, 
At that point, in a much better known part of the story, the increasing tensions between the Japanese and the Americans led, of course, to the all-out confrontation that brought both, brought both the Americans and British into the war in the Pacific. But it's often forgotten that the Chinese, having already fought for four and a half years, were also part of that wider Asian theater. And for most of that period between 1941 and 44, 45, it remained imp immensely important to, to keep the Chinese in the war. They fought mostly within their own boundaries, although they did take part in the Burma campaigns, first in 1942 and, 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 and 44. By the end of the war, China was on its uppers. And when the atomic bombs dropped in 1945, bringing the Asian war to a sudden conclusion, China was really suffering very, very greatly. Starvation, conscription of soldiers because they couldn't get enough recruits. The economy was really on its uppers. This was a very, very devastating set of events. And as I mentioned before, the end, the casualty rate in the end was over 10 million dead. So this was a really very devastating set of events that completely destroyed the flawed but real modernization that China had been seeing up to 1937 when the war broke out. I guess that sounds to me like a narrative that is, in a way, deprives the Chinese of something that's rather crucial to, the, say, the British and Russian and American views, which is the climactic moment of victory brought about by your own efforts. Uh, you know, it's not the fall of Berlin to Russian troops or D-Day or whatever. It's a, an external event, the atomic bombs uh, on, on Japan that, that really brings it to a close. How, how do they get around that and still construct a, a, a patriotic narrative? Well, I think the slightly provocative answer here, and I apologize to any of our French viewers and, and listeners, is that General de Gaulle managed to take an even more kind of worrying situation and turn it into a victory. I mean, essentially managing to get France defined as one of the five allied powers after World War II was an act of supreme uh, statesmanship, if one might put it that way. And I think the Chinese, who actually were very aware of what was going on in France, rather felt that uh, if, if that was the case, there was no reason why they shouldn't be counted, not least since unlike France, it has to be said, significant Chinese forces fought for four and a half years before Pearl Harbor. So in that sense, the point about not using their own efforts, I think, would be pushed back by most of the Chinese who analyze it on the grounds that actually the first phase of what became a global war, the Asian front was very much undertaken by the Chinese. To put it the other way, the other way around, supposing China had surrendered, as many British diplomatic observers thought it would do in 1938, the history of the Asian war, would be very different because, of course, China would have had to make a compromise with uh, Japan as the collaborators in China, including uh, the former nationalist leader Wang Jingwei, did actually want it to do. But beyond that, of course, the global war would be different because if you don't have China continuing to fight all that way, you don't get to Pearl Harbor and you don't get the combination of the, the two fronts. So that having been said, the question of how it's used today, I think, is an interesting one. And Xi Jinping, no less, the Chinese you know, leader, president and general secretary of the party, frequently talks about how World War II was the first Wanxuan, complete victory of China against a foreign power. And I think the answer they would come up with is that if you look at the totality of what happens, the Chinese effort, and then the American and the British effort that come into the war, you can't claim that China is the sole victor through its own efforts. That's obviously not a tenable position to take. But you can make a very good case that the Chinese element is a very important one in making sure that the allied effort in Asia was sustained and that without that, the overall Allied victory could not have been, uh, been won. Now, historians can go back and forth over this, but I think that most Chinese who look at that war history would not actually feel today that they had that much to apologize, uh, uh, well, not apologize for, but to, to have to make excuses for, uh, in the sense that their own efforts and the number of casualties and so forth were actually, in many ways, determinative of the final Allied victory. Mm. And how much is the current Chinese version of, of, of history, how much is that directed or towards hostility towards Japan, the invader? I mean, because obviously we're, we're in a period where I think arguably China has now clearly displaced Japan as the most powerful country in the region, but there may be felt to be unsettled business, particularly because the Japanese themselves have a slightly ambiguous attitude to their own uh, Second World War history, uh, to put it kindly. Uh, so. Is this not just about the past, but about a very current antagonism with Japan? I think the Japan element is immensely important for the reasons that you've outlined, but it's actually one of a set of factors and I think others may be even more important. I mean, on Japan briefly, you're right to say that there is an element of the Japanese right wing that is 
let's just say, more than acceptably ambivalent about the precise role of Japan during World War II. But the Japanese left and much of the mainstream, I think, you know, has uh, knowledge that this was a horrific set of events for which Japan was responsible. And I think one can also, you know, push, as ha sometimes happens in China, the idea too far that the Japanese have never really acknowledged the, the past. That, that, that isn't the case, I, I, I think. But actually, I think that the primary purpose, and I make this quite, case quite strongly, I think, in, in the book, China's Good War, is that the primary thrust is in two other directions as to why China is really concentrating so much on, on World War II. On the international front, I think it's much more to do as so many things are these days with the United States. And in particular, I think you can see that when you look at some of the statements that top leaders make. I mean, I'm thinking for instance of uh, Wang Yi, the current foreign minister, who at this year's 2020 security conference in Munich, so, started almost his comments by telling the audience, don't forget China was the first country to be a signatory to the United Nations Charter in April 1945 in, in San Francisco, which historically is, is accurate. The point is that China, by Wang Yi by making that statement, and China more broadly in terms of the way it looks at those events now, wants to make the case very clearly that it's not just the Americans who were, to use the American Secretary of State, Dean Acheson's phrase, present at the creation. China also, because of its wartime sacrifices and because it was there in San Francisco and also took part in the charter and all of that, was also a creator of the current post-1945 world order. And a large part of the revival of the World War II collective memory, I think, is to boost that particular story about China being, to use Bob Zellick's phrase, a responsible global power. The other element, I think is really about China's sense of itself domestically. And as I think I've indicated, but would, you know, would make, make the point again, China today has huge numbers of people who feel that while their standards of living have been increasing, there's this sort of hole in the middle in terms of a sense of kind of common purpose and collective identity. And I think for many people, you know, whether it's something as simple as playing a video game that you know, reenacts the, um, the World War II period, or going and seeing this hit movie, The 800, which is about sort of personal sacrifice in the face of a national invasion for the greater good, is a post, I think, to, to boost that sort of feeling that there is this wider sense of moral purpose in the contemporary Chinese state, and that it has its point of moral origin in fighting the good fight against fascism during World War II, rather like the argument that the British and the Americans make about participation in the war in our own Western societies. Yeah, and I mean, so give us a sense then, obviously in popular culture in the UK, in the US, so many films, books, etc., are still about the Second World War, they're the big hits. Um, how much uh, is the popular culture that Chinese people consume now, whether it's on television or the internet, how, much, how Second World War focused is it? Huge amounts of Chinese popular culture still focus on the Second World War. There is absolutely no doubt about that. But the bits of the Second World War that it concentrates on can vary from place to place. And sometimes the state and the creative media, if you want to put it that way, who actually get uh, popular culture relating to World War II out there come, come into conflict. So just a few years ago, there was an official state edict, which I think was highly secret, but immediately leaked, like many Chinese state edicts are, that told TV uh, drama producers not to produce so many ludicrous dramas in which one bullet from a Chinese warrior managed to fell, you know, sort of 200 Japanese soldiers at one go because they said it actually looked ridiculous and made the World War II effort in, in some ways seem uh, less serious than it actually, uh, actually was. But in terms, for instance, of um, television, this 2020, uh, one of the hit series showing on Chinese TV, which by the way, um, viewers can tune into and see on YouTube with English subtitles. It's perfectly easily uh, uh, available. It's just that uh, Westerners don't tend to do it very much. Uh, Autumn Cicada is uh, about uh, sort of spy intrigues in 1941, uh, led by uh, the Chinese Communist Party underground in the wartime years. And in contrast with that, as I mentioned, the, the movie, The 800, which is actually just released the week we're speaking in mid-September in the United Kingdom, and I think elsewhere in the West, that's a movie about the nationalist war effort. So both sides, the communists and the nationalists, are still out there in the popular culture. You can also find other genres. So for instance, there was quite a genre by people such as uh, the, the writer, um, this is a few years ago now, but the writer uh, Fang Jun, uh, which was a sort of, he was born in the 19, uh, 1950s, but it was a sort of personal memoir of talking to his dad about his dad's uh, wartime experience fighting the Japanese and sort of rethinking his identity as a young Ch Chinese through these rather, you know, the, it was kind of like the greatest generation for the Americans, that sort of um, 
uh, kind of uh, writing. And last but not least, but I want you to remember that as in the rest of the world, social media is a huge source of all these sorts of discussions. So one group of people who become very famous are the, in what are called in China, the Guofen, which, uh, Guofen, which means nationalist party fans. And what this means is people who kind of have kind of almost cyber wars online about how much of the fighting in World War II at Shanghai or these other kind of great battles of the time were won by the nationalist soldiers and how much were actually won by the communist soldiers. And all these people, I assume they're mostly male, uh, you know, they're, they're probably not very, very, very ancient. I mean, they're you know, probably in their I don't know, 20s, 30s, whatever. But these are real sort of disputes in which I think ideas about contemporary China are being filtered through these ideas about what the World War II past really meant. So whether it's, you know, on screen or in, in cyberspace, World War II is everywhere in China. Mm. But it's interesting then, because that implies, uh, makes the point really, that this is not a narrative that's completely controlled by the Chinese Communist Party, that, that there are people out there on the internet making arguments about the role of the nationalists that the, that the party might not feel that comfortable with. Um, and yet again, a point you make in the, your book is that at times Xi Jinping himself has been an active participant in, in talking about how the Second World War should be memorialized. That's absolutely right. I mean, one of the things that is really notable is that although the state clearly wants to control a great deal of what's said about World War II, and you mentioned, you know, as you say, Xi Jinping has made several speeches in recent years in which he says that the significance of the war of resistance should be greater and more greatly understood both at home and abroad and has put both resources and you know, a significant amount of political control into how the war is portrayed. The one thing that again doing the research of the book showed is that it's, it, it can only be controlled up to a certain point because people put back into it what they want to see. So perhaps one of the most interesting counter examples is a man called Fan Jianchuan who is a quite well known, he started off as a property developer, as so many of the, the rich in China did. But when he made enough money in his home province of Sichuan, down in southwest China, he decided to put the money into a museum complex. And this is still open today, you can find it, find it online as well, the Jianchuan Museum Complex, in which, amongst other things, he has a museum of the nationalists, i.e. the non-communist contributions to World War II, which gets, from all accounts, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of visitors every year. And this isn't an exact sort of poke in the eye to the communist rhetoric, because it's not directly saying that it's wrong. But what it is saying is that there are many aspects of the history of this war that relate to people's regional memories, to the memories of their grandparents, which maybe don't immediately kind of fit in with what the uh, official version in Beijing says. And my museum, which is a private enterprise, he says, my museum is there to give people some sort of access to those sorts of memories. So, of course, China is a heavily controlled authoritarian society, which has become more so in recent years. But the idea that there aren't opportunities for people to have their own, I think, rather individual takes on what the war means to them, and often use it for some slight, slight critiques of the wider, uh, wider Chinese uh, society, uh, that I think is, is, is important to understand. It, it's a very flexible way of thinking about many of the problems of contemporary Chinese society as well. Yeah, now to pick up the thread. I mean, so we talked about how the party relates to the history and how it's, it, it relates in, in popular culture. But of course, his, history is to some extent, considerable extent, made by historians such as yourself. So to what extent has the kind of reinterpretation and, uh, of the importance of history been the result of uh, changes in the Chinese Academy and Chinese historians themselves working away in the archives? That would be a very kind of Western way of things to happen. Is, is that sort of what happened in China? Actually, it's a very Chinese way that things happened uh, as well, uh, Gideon. I'm glad that, you know, those of us who are academic historians are used to our work remaining probably in deserved obscurity and occasionally coming out into the, uh, into the light. But actually, one of the things that's worth noting is that the Chinese state treats historians, in a sense, both more uh, significantly than Western societies do because it does actually care a lot, a lot about what they say, but also it tends to constrain what they say for precisely the same reasons. So it's uh, a form of flattery, but also uh, a form of, uh, of, of control. So I'd say that there's a definite pipeline and all of the things that we've been talking about, you know, this plethora of World War II movies in China or television programs or video games or, you know, social media discussions, they all stem from the fact that really in the 1980s and 1990s, there was a sort of 
historiographical revolution in the uh, Chinese um, academic world when it came to looking at World War II. And I would say that what happened really was that when the Cultural Revolution was over and when Mao had died in 1976-78, Deng Xiaoping's China, which it then was of course, allowed scholars basically to open up areas of inquiry that they hadn't been able to talk about before. Sorry, we're going to have to stop. Um, okay. Um, Margot, yeah. I'm really sorry, can you stop hoovering? Stop for now? Because I'm, yeah, because I'm talking. Yes, sir. <laughs> I, I, no, no, it's fine. I genuinely couldn't hear anything, actually, Gideon. Yeah, I, I just thought about, I, but, you, yeah, but if it's distracting you, then obviously, yeah, you want to make sure that. Take uh, that question. Just, just. Um, sure. Okay. So, Rana, um, we talked about the way in which the history has been remade by the party and in popular culture. But what role did history professors such as yourself play? I mean, has there been a process that's been going on in the academy as well? Well, I wouldn't give myself the credit that I've ever affected anything that involved real politics, but that's not true for Chinese historians who have actually had a huge influence in the changing way that people think about World War II in, in, in China. Essentially, in the 1980s, you know, in the era after the Cultural Revolution, when China was actually opening up in all sorts of ways, particularly for academic inquiry in a variety of areas, including economics. I mean, you know, Gideon, from your FT uh, position, you'll be aware that China's economy is one of those things that has essentially taken on capitalism at full throttle. And it did so in the 1980s because they were willing to listen to new um, uh, economic methods that they simply hadn't thought of under the old uh, uh, old system. And the, the historian Julian Gewirtz has written very brilliantly about that particular um, area. So the same is true for history. Basically, lots of the very well-trained, very impressive historians of modern China are places like universities in Nanjing and Fudan in Shanghai and the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences all got together in conferences for the first time liberated from having to mouth, you know, the, the slogans of the Cultural Revolution and said in, in one actually very notable article in the mid 1980s in one of the major Chinese academic journals, look, our existing history of World War II is unsatisfactory. It concentrates too much on just what the communists did, not what the other um, uh, players, including the Chinese nationalists did or the Americans or the British. And we need a much more comprehensive understanding of what actually happened during those war years. And during that relatively liberal period, the Chinese Communist Party, to give it credit, did cautiously and somewhat reluctantly allow them to open up those areas of debate. Now, ever since then, the historical freedom to write about these things has waxed and waned as freedoms do in China under the Chinese Communist Party. And I'd say right now it's probably one of the, you know, for, for sure, one of the more constrained times in terms of freedom in the Chinese Academy. But overall, if you look over the last 30 or 40 years I do in the book, you will see that the areas of discussion in the Chinese academic sphere, including some quite ticklish subjects like uh, Chinese collaboration with the Japanese. But more than that, really, this, this reassessment of the role of all of the non-communist actors has become absolutely central to research within the Chinese universities. And you might say that that's the seed corn in which it's much bigger popular culture reassessing World War II on television or on screen has emerged from. Without the professional historians, China's popular culture would not have re-embraced World War II in that way. And as a Western historian working on the same issues, do you find yourself in a sense in a common dialogue with your Chinese colleagues in the way you would be with colleagues in America, or is it very constrained by the fact that the political system they operate under or something in between? It's a common dialogue and actually over the years it's been a huge pleasure to be in Beijing, Shanghai and uh, Chongqing and other places to debate these issues alongside my, my Chinese colleagues, without whom, by the way, both this book and previous books I've written would not have been possible because they've always pointed me in the direction of archives and documents uh, and things that as a solo Westerner I probably would never have, uh, uh, have come across. But having said that, it's not quite the same dialogue as I have with my British or my American colleagues for one simple reason. China's World War II experience is increasingly becoming part of the way in which we understand the global war. And I'd cite books like uh, recent you know, books for a, an informed general audience like um, Hans van der Ven's China at War or Richard B. Frank's Tower of Skulls, which really put the China element of World War II into a wider global and regional perspective. But for the Chinese historians, this is the war, you know, in the way that for the Brits, for us, it's 
the Blitz or, you know, it's El Alamein or for the Americans, it's, you know, it's the Pacific and Midway and uh, it's the liberation of, of, of Italy and, and, and Germany. So for the Chinese, you know, the Battle of Paraduang, the Battle of Changsha, Shanghai, these very unfamiliar names to Westerners are the core part of the historical debates that they, uh, that, that, that they, that they have. Um, questions such as, for instance, would it have been possible for the Chinese economy to survive under the economic blockade from the Japanese that basically plagued it during much of those years? It's an immensely important question. It provides a lot of comparative uh, uh, value when we look at the uh, economies of wartime Europe as well. But the fact is that the Chinese element for my Chinese colleagues will always be central and much more uh, important in that sense. And you know, those of us who are involved in this are from the West feel privileged to take part in the discussions, but in a sense, they're owned by the Chinese. Sure. Um, and they seem to me to be, reading your book, to be having a very classical debate about periodization, but, but really rather crucial one about both when the war began from a Chinese point of view and when the war ended. So did the war begin in 31 or 37? Did it end in 45 or 49 in some sense? Um, can you explain the significance of those debates? Yes, absolutely. And this is one of the things that I, as you say, I, I discuss in a bit uh, in, in, in the book, because actually it shows how in China, and this is different from elsewhere in the world, the political imperative and the historical imperative sometimes either come up against each other or have to, to take account of each other. So essentially for a very long time, there was a debate, it was a genuine academic debate about whether in China, the war began in 1937 with the outbreak of war at the Marco Polo Bridge in, in 19, uh, July the 7th, 1937, or whether you might start it as, uh, judge it as starting with the Manchurian incident, the Japanese invasion of Manchuria on September 18th, 1931. And the debates basically center on, you know, if you think that the long date, which makes World War II in that definition 14 years long from 1931 to 45, then you would argue, well, look, you know, once the Japanese have launched this huge invasion, they invade Manchuria. It's a region that's the size of France and Germany combined. You know, this is a very significant chunk of real estate. Why wouldn't you call that the beginning of World War II? But on the other side, you would say, and I have to say, I, I follow this more, this interpretation more myself. Yes, true, but at the same time, there's still diplomatic relations between China and Japan. There are temporary truces in 1933 and 35 that bring the temperature down before it goes up again in, in 37. So you can't regard it, I think, as a full-scale war in a way that it is after 37. Anyway, that's the kind of thing that historians debated in China, as well as between Westerners and Chinese. But a couple of years ago, the Chinese government came down with an edict, which is still very much in force today. The official history, very official, says that World War II is from 1931 to 1945, full stop. Now, there are a variety of reasons why they went for that. One reason I think less stated, but I think in there, is they want to uh, probably make the Japanese feel as guilty as possible about having the longest war possible. You know, 14 years of war is, of course, even worse than, than, than eight. Also, and this is a more interesting reason, perhaps, there was a question of sort of regional competition because the Northeast, Manchuria, the, the, the Northeastern provinces of China, said, if you don't count World War II until 1937, you're basically saying that battles like Shanghai and the attacks on Chongqing down the southwest, they're part of proper World War II, but we were invaded and had to suffer under the Japanese for 14 years and you don't count our suffering. So it's almost a sort of internal politics of making sure that every part of China gets a piece of World War II as part of this, uh, uh, this, uh, this, this historical recognition that led to that official statement that, right guys, it's 1931 to 45. The end of the war, I think, is fairly, much agreed as being in, 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 in August 1945, September 1945. But at the same time, there's plenty of debate still about what would have happened if the atomic bombs hadn't dropped. And it's worth thinking that, of course, the plan had been for a lot more land war in Asia, as well as uh, an invasion of Japan. So there's plenty of discussion about the what ifs of the end of the war in, in China, as there are elsewhere. Yeah, I think I guess I misphrased that. But I think, as I understood your book, you were saying that the, that interregnum, the between the end of the Second World War and the communist triumph in 49, when nationalists are still in charge, is still a, a kind of awkward period to, to explain. And Awkward, but really important. Thank you for bringing that up, Gideon, because actually that's one of the, if, if I'm making it a kind of one argumentative point with the book, that's one that I think is really important. It's what I call the Chinese post-war. Because if you know a bit about 
Chinese history, I mean, not as a professional historian, but you know, just someone who reads around and, and knows the kind of the, the, the basic signposts. 1949, the final communist victory uh, in uh, the civil war against the nationalists is for very good and obvious reasons still a major turning point. And for that reason, the years between the end of World War II and the defeat in the civil war seem like a sort of coda, you know, this awful civil war and then finally the communists win. But actually in China itself, Lots of people are now going back to that period and realizing that lots of things that are really important today, such as the legal justifications or non-justifications for China's territorial claims in South China Sea or the islands in the East China, China Sea, actually stem from things that happened in those intervening years. Uh, the 11 dash line in the South China Sea first appears in that form in a map, I think in 1947, uh, under the nationalist government. China fought, it gets its seat as a permanent five member of the UN Security Council, something it's very proud of today and uses as, as often as possible, not under the communists, who are actually excluded, of course, for 25 years from the, the UN, but under the Chinese nationalists. The Tokyo trials, the International Military Tribunal for the Far East with a Chinese judge judging sitting in judgment internationally there uh, for, uh, for the first time. That happened in 1948. So that post-war set of years, having been ignored for a long time, both by the West and China, is now actually being brought back in Chinese consciousness as a post-war period when China began to reap the benefits of being an allied power, and which today's, you might say that today's communist China is cashing a check that was written for them by Chiang Kai-shek's government back in 1945. Mm. And I mean, we talked about how um, the Chinese view of the Second World War affects their relations with Japan. We also alluded to, in a way, the more important rivalry now with the United States uh, for dominance in the Pacific and perhaps dominance of the 21st century as the most powerful country. And again, you make the point that they're almost kind of competing claims or interpretations of the Second World War. Uh, that back up different claims. And I, I mean, I, re I remember talking to, you know, a senior member actually of the Obama administration dealing with China who said to me, well, you know, his father had fought in the Pacific uh, with the American Navy and that America had dominated these waters ever since then. And that frankly, they were not going to give that up. And that, so that was a very, you know, a view of America's role in the Pacific totally rooted in, in, uh, in the second world war. But uh, does China's view, in a sense, contest that American claim to the right of dominance of the Pacific? It absolutely does. I mean, one of the most important elements of the story, the narrative that the uh, Chinese Communist Party and China as a whole, not just communists by any means, now tell about its World War II experience is that it too was a liberator against the forces of the Axis, in, in the case of Asia, of course, against the uh, Japanese. And they, of course, acknowledge the American role as being very central and indeed primary in many ways, but they object deeply to the almost complete exclusion of China from that story. I mean, just one particular example, within the last few weeks in Britain, we've been commemorating the end of the Burma campaign, uh, which you know, ended uh, World War II. Um, and it's almost never mentioned that the Chinese exp expeditionary force was part of that fight in uh, Burma alongside the British and the Australians uh, and the Americans, who of course were also very much there, Indian troops as well, I should, uh, I should say. In other words, World War II gives a sort of moral foundation in this narrative to the Chinese presence in, in the in region and the formation of order in the region in a way that simply having a huge PLA Navy or the ability to basically use air defenses to cover the South China Sea uh, doesn't do in quite the same way. That is a story of power, whereas what the Chinese also want is a story of moral rights, of sacrifice that enables them to have the role there. The problem is, I think there is a big problem, that this is not likely to be as successful as the American version for two quick reasons. One is that, of course, starting to create that narrative 50 years after the event doesn't have the same power as it does if you follow on immediately afterwards. And the second issue is that, of course, while the American legacy of World War II is very important in the historical basis of why they're in the Pacific to this day, the fact that from the 70s and 80s onwards, most of the American allies became democratic, uh, South Korea uh, and so forth, um, uh, means that there is a much greater sense that there's also a contemporary political consensus 
behind the American presence in the region. Whereas China, of course, is not uh, looking to use democratic means to try and uh, embed its presence in the region. So its World War II story doesn't feed into quite the same sort of democratic narrative that the American one does. Absolutely, and that brings us to my last question. I mean, your book uh, is a work of scholarship and you describe things um, in neutral terms as, as is appropriate, but do you worry at all that the version of the Second World War that the Chinese uh, have in popular culture and in academia and its, and its prominence may create a kind of uh, revanchist or, avert or overly nationalist um, view of the world? Uh, you know, here in the UK, I guess Brexit has made us interrogate our own relationship with the Second World War and isn't an entirely healthy relationship. Is China's relationship with the Second World War a healthy relationship? Well, I think it's right. I hope, by the way, that I'm objective rather than uh, neutral, since I'd like to think that there's quite a lot of uh, viewpoints in, in, in the book, but I hope they're all ones that fair-minded people will think that I've given a good shot to, uh, to, to, to both sides. And of course, it's one of the single most important questions facing, well, frankly, the world, but certainly Asia today. What is Chinese nationalism about and is it likely to become an angry force that essentially could uh, destroy peace in the region and beyond? I think there are dangers in that. They really are. I mean, we've been seeing during the COVID pandemic uh, occasions where what's become known as wolf warrior diplomacy, named after a famous movie of a few years ago, has resulted in a Chinese foreign policy position in terms of the views of other countries that seems much more geared towards firing up a social media audience within China itself with very confrontational you know, tweets and, and messages rather than really trying to smooth out the diplomacy of the region. And I think that has the potential to be very dangerous and I very much hope that China's going to be stepping back a bit from uh, that side of things. That said, I don't think the World War II rhetoric actually is the most difficult part of that. I think that one of the things that is most important about, in a sense, is potentially productive about the World War II narrative that China's putting forward is the side that is about cooperation and the idea that basically a legacy of World War II for China is that P5 seat at the United Nations, that a legacy of China's World War II uh, experience is that it has this memory of suffering, not these three things like the horrific you know, Nanjing massacre of uh, and these other sorts of events that means that it should have a greater empathy in terms of understanding how others have suffered as well. If it can leverage that into what Chinese foreign policy doesn't yet really show, which is a sense of a sort of altruistic empathy towards other actors, understanding how other small countries in the region feel about Chinese power, transmitting those feelings of trauma and invasion and horror and helplessness that you read over and over again in the sources from China in the 1930s and 40s and you know really are, are heartrending in many ways to understand that the way that people felt uh, the Chinese people felt then is something that nobody else ever wants to feel either well I think there's no suggestion in, in any sense that China is going to launch the sort of uh, a war of, of, of that sort the understanding that very large powerful countries in your region however well or otherwise intentioned they may be have the potential to cause real alarm is something that I think Chinese foreign policy needs to understand and perhaps hasn't really internalized successfully at all yeah uh, at all well so maybe reading a bit more of their own history on that front I'm not I'm certainly not a person to ask Chinese people to read more Chinese history but I think Chinese history is great I think we could all in the world do with reading more of it and I think the lessons for it are some that could help to soften and I think improve much of the Chinese uh, face that it's placing towards the world at the uh, at the moment. Rana Mitter, thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much indeed Gideon and thank you for discussing China's Good War which I hope some people will find an interesting read.